Welcome everybody to ISIS Parenting's Breastfeeding Webinar Chat and Learn. My name is Nancy Holtzman. I'm a mother baby nurse educator, board certified lactation consultant, board certified in pediatrics, and I'm here at ISIS Parenting in Needham, Massachusetts, uh, as I am almost every Thursday at 12 noon here to share some breastfeeding information and then answer some questions. With me today is Katie Goldsberry. She's our moderator in the chit chat room. Katie is the mom of two beautiful children. Uh, she did uh, continue to nurse and work and pump, and uh, I'm sure she has some thoughts about uh, nursing and sleeping at night as well during those first few years. So thank you, Katie, for being here today. She's one of our program uh, uh, associates and um, also is a licensed massage therapist here at ISIS Parenting. So today we are going to talk about nighttime nursing. And um, this is an interesting topic because uh, I got the idea to cover this because I also oversee our uh, sleep program here. And on Tuesday, we covered um, gentle reduction of night feedings. And so I do reference uh, those slides a little bit and will point you to that direction for another uh, view on the same topic. So they're similar views because here at ISIS, we all work together as a team and we try not to contradict uh, different focus areas. So an example of that would be when we teach swaddling in our newborn care class and infant care class A lot of times we talk about swaddling with the arms down because that does lead uh, to uh, Longer sleep stretches for the slightly older baby uh, Rather than having the arms swaddled across the chest like you see done in the hospital setting But then of course in the breastfeeding classes uh, we talk about how uh, having the baby bring the hands to the mouth is an early feeding cue and, and so on. So we, we try to come up with uh, some sort of a cohesive message and explain the different, the slightly different points of view. So when it comes to sleep, if your focus is uh, on getting the longest, most uninterrupted sleep stretches that you possibly can, uh, you're going to get different advice uh, than if your focus is on uh, increasing your milk supply Here and point out uh, different options that you may have when it comes to nighttime feedings and um, the different implications. So we certainly do expect babies to eat at night and parents are going to be tired, uh, especially during the first three or four months. And I think everybody knows that in the earliest weeks, babies don't have much sense of whether it's three o'clock in the afternoon or whether it's three o'clock in the morning, and they're going to want to to eat uh, frequently. They cluster feed. Uh, a newborn may want to nurse 10 to 12 times in a 24-hour period. They may want to nurse and doze, nurse and doze. Uh, a typical pattern may be cluster feeding in the evening when they may want to eat at 6 p.m., 7.30, 8.45, 10 p.m., uh, and then finally crash out for two or three or four hours solid. So um, you'll see uh, the feeding become a little bit more regular as the baby moves into uh, the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth weeks, and we'll look at that shortly. Um, from the from the metabolic feeding perspective, uh, around five to nine months, you'll begin to see uh, well what we call the bookends to the day, beginning to establish a regular bedtime routine, uh, a bedtime uh, that doesn't shift much more than half an hour in either direction most nights, and then a consistent morning wake up time. That's a good approach if you're trying to have consistent sleep. And uh, can, you know, and getting into the habit of more consistent napping during the day. And so, if a baby is doing uh, 10 or 12 hours of nighttime sleep, you'll a.m. and then again, uh, they'll be up perhaps at 3 or 4 a.m. Uh, but toward the latter half of that time frame, closer to eight or nine months, typically uh, it's very possible that your baby would just be getting up once, uh, typically in the early morning hours, 2, 3, 4 a.m. to nurse and then go back to sleep. Um, and then between nine to 12 months, again, metabolically speaking, it's possible uh, for the baby to drop that feeding all on their own or for the parent to proactively uh, begin to eliminate that nighttime feeding. 
Now, if this, if these uh, sleep plots are not familiar to you, this is what we use in our sleep support program and our sleep consults, and we t and we show these sleep plot plots in our sleep webinars. But let me try to explain, and I know it's very small here, um, but what you see here is a long strip of paper that's chopped up into three and a half strips, and this is uh, one infant's sleep for uh, the entire first year of this baby's life. So um, starting, uh, let's see. I'm fancy I can make a pointer. No, not like that. I hope I didn't show that on your screen. Pointer. Here we go. Okay, so starting here, if you can see the number one, from here it goes uh, let me see, oh, full screen. Here we go. I don't know if that just does it on my screen or if that does it on your screen too, but if you can see the full screen option, then uh, you'll get a better view of this. Um, so. the tenth week, and so on. And what you see across here is the hours of the day. So it starts at midnight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, so this is, uh, this is around noontime, and now here we are in the evening, and then 11 p.m., and now we're back at midnight again. Uh, and so this is the end of the, the first year. So what you can see is uh, this area this is, for example, uh, sleep, where, wherever it's black is sleep. And so what you're seeing here is sleep that starts around 7 p.m. or so. Uh, and then, you know, it kind of loops around and starts back here because this is midnight. So this child is really sleeping, uh, looks like, you know, approximately from 7 to, to 6 or 7 in the morning. And everywhere it's white is the time that the baby is awake. So an example here, this is a, uh, a nice example. Um, so again, this. This, this uh, portion of the strip uh, are weeks 31 to 45. Um, and so, you know, this baby is uh, seven, eight, nine months or, or eight, nine, ten months. Um, and you can see the baby is getting uh, nice chunks of uninterrupted sleep. And then um, this is when they're awake in the morning. Then they have their mid-morning mid nap. And this is when they're awake in the middle of the day. And then they have an afternoon nap. Uh, and then they're awake for a period of time and then go to sleep. You can see uh, here in the newborn phase how the sleep is completely erratic and disorganized. They're awake, they're asleep, they're awake, they're asleep. There's, you know, it's just on and off. And then you see here, uh, you can begin to see more consistency actually uh, right here around week uh, nine or 10, where you're starting to see this fairly consistent strip where the baby is asleep. And you see this fairly consistent strip here where the baby is awake. Uh, and by the time the baby is Uh, but if you if you are looking for consistency, this is an example of a consistent pattern here. Starting around uh, 12 or 13 weeks, you're starting to see uh, this baby has a consistent, fairly consistent bedtime in here. So the baby is going to sleep, it looks like, probably around 8 or so uh, p.m. Everywhere it's black, the baby's sleeping. So here you get a couple of little wake-ups. Um, you know, it loops around, loops around here because this is midnight of the next day here. Uh, so sometimes the baby is up around one uh, or two or not. They sleep through. Um, and then they're you know, uh, up in the uh, early morning. This is around 2 or 3 AM, back to sleep when mom is bleary-eyed and having her coffee. And then this is uh, you know, morning, wake, morning waking time. OK. And you can also see here how, um, how the baby goes from three naps, again, black is sleep. So uh, they're, they're awake in the morning, and then they're having their first morning nap, the midday nap, and then the afternoon nap. And you can see how uh, later on it shifts to the two naps during the day rather than three. OK, so. Oh, that didn't work. That's not what I wanted to do. Hold on a moment. Oh, dear. One moment while I load these back up. It shouldn't take long. It didn't take long at all. OK. So um, that just gives you a little history in terms of um, 
you know, the erraticness of infant, of newborn sleep, and then it becomes a little bit more organized. You can see the bedtime routine portion um, and the first chunk of sleep actually becomes more organized uh, as early as eight weeks, and that's really a good time to begin having a bedtime routine in place. Um, and again, there's more on our, the sleep webinar page, and I'll give you a link to that a little bit later. In terms of the difference talking about infant uh, newborn sleep, infant sleep, and whether a baby is breastfed or bottle feeding formula, here's a few things to think about. Um, certainly when a baby is uh, bottle feeding formula, they are going to take typically larger volumes of milk, and that milk does stay in their uh, stomach longer because it's a different type of curd that takes longer for the baby to digest. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that it's better, um, although it's less convenient for moms to have to nurse a little bit more often because babies typically take slightly smaller volumes when they're nursing and also the breast milk is more digestible. We certainly know that um, you know, for a myriad of reasons, the breast milk is healthier for the baby and is the desired milk. But um, there are ways to compromise so that you can get your needed rest and help your baby learn, uh, really learn most importantly as the baby gets older, um, to separate feeding from sleeping a little bit so that they're not up each time they're in a light sleep stage in the middle of the night needing to nurse in order to fall back asleep. That's really the issue. It's not always uh, metabolic or about hunger. It's about uh, how the baby learns to fall asleep. Um, but that's really impacted by your philosophies, and there's no right or wrong answer here. Everybody is, needs to make these decisions on their own, and the decisions will shift uh, sometimes based on the age and stage of your baby, and sometimes your level of fatigue and exhaustion. Uh, you may feel one way uh, when your baby is an infant, and then when your baby is a little bit older and you feel like they've got you know, a few more resources. on their own, uh, or maybe you've started back to work and, um, you know, and you're finding that you're really dragging and that you really need more than four uninterrupted hours of sleep at night, and so you're willing to make some adjustments in order to help the baby sleep longer so that you can sleep longer. So those are just different examples of, of how things can shift with time. Um, your proximity to the baby definitely has impact uh, as a nursing mom. So if you're, if you're room sharing, bed sharing, uh, co-sleeping, and let me define those terms. Room sharing means having the baby um, in, you know, in reach uh, so that you're aware of the baby sounds and the baby is aware of your sounds. Uh, co-sleeping does not mean bed sharing, although people interchange those terms. Co-sleeping means having the baby in close proximity to the mother, uh, and the American Academy of Pediatrics actually recommends co-sleeping, but they recommend the baby be on a separate sleep surface. So that would be, for example, a bassinet, uh, a crib, a pack and play, or a bedside co-sleeper at the bedside of the mother, rather than having the baby directly in bed with the mom. Now, even the American Academy of Pediatrics says, bring the baby into your bed for feeding or soothing, but then put the baby back on a separate sleep surface. That's, so that's their recommendation, and we'll talk about all the different opinions you'll hear on this uh, in just aware and you're aware, but it is the simplest and easiest and fastest way to help your baby settle back to sleep. And so uh, as long as you and your baby are happy and comfortable and everybody is getting adequate volumes of sleep uh, with uh, safety in mind, then, um, you know, then where your baby sleeps sometimes is, is just a, a personal family decision. Uh, but sleep location matters because it's very difficult to resettle your baby back to sleep when your baby is, is tucked right in your armpit uh, without giving them the breast. Um, I put this little cartoon here and there's a link underneath it that I encourage you to visit later because uh, it's just a great little uh, cartoon about this mom's adventures with, with uh, overnight sleep and listening to her husband snore, snore and her baby taking over the bed and then the toddler comes in and then the cat wakes her up. It's just very cute. 
Um, so ease of feeding versus maternal fatigue. Um, again, if you're if you're co-sleeping or bed sharing, um, and and it's easy for you to roll over, and nurse your baby, your baby falls back asleep, you fall back asleep. Um, then uh, it night, night nighttime nursing may not be an issue for you. If you're exhausted because uh, you don't like to bed share and your baby is kicking you in the in the chest or in the head all night long, uh, or you can't sleep because the baby is there and it makes you concerned, uh, or your baby is starting to wake up more at night to nurse rather than less, and this is a common uh, common issue. So. Um, sometime around four and five months, sleep associations really become significant in terms of your baby's uninterrupted sleep. And so depending on how your baby has learned to fall asleep, sometimes you will begin to see more sleep waking, uh, more nighttime waking around four and five and six, uh, six months so that you're nursing the baby back to sleep more and more. Um, and so that sometimes is what triggers a sleep consult, we find, uh, because they, they feel like things are going backward. I will point out that physiologically, uh, your prolactin levels peak during nighttime feeding, and in particular, uh, that 2, 3, 4 a.m. Uh, breastfeeding session or a pumping session, if you're a pumping mom, um, really does wonders for your milk production. And uh, it's really a shame that biology has planned it this way, but um, you know, it, uh, it's not unusual that a baby will sleep from uh, 7 or 8 p.m. until 2 or 3 a.m., wake up, eat, and go back to sleep. Um, and even though that is tiring to do, uh, it is good for your milk production. Um, hunger versus habit and reinforced metabolic intake patterns. This is a tough one to tease out, but um, uh, babies certainly can eat hungrily. Even a six, not six, eight, ten month old baby can certainly take a very good meal in the middle of the night uh, rather than just nursing to fall back asleep. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that ongoing, they're required you're required and they're required to, to need that food overnight, that becomes a learned metabolic pattern and their daily intake actually shifts. Uh, and sometimes moms get concerned because um, they're afraid to begin breaking down or cutting, cutting back on that nighttime nursing because the baby doesn't feed so well during the day uh, or you know, isn't very interested in eating solids or nursing so much during the day. And so they feel that those nighttime nursing sessions are important uh, calorically and nutritionally for the baby. But again, this becomes uh, a perpetuating cycle. Daytime intake does improve. Um, you know, we have gradually learned to shift and not eat overnight. Um, and babies physiologically can learn to do that as well. Uh, generally, uh, you know, around nine months of age, most pediatricians uh, and most research would agree that babies don't necessarily need to eat at night. Now, again, uh, each individual baby is different. And again, if you're if you're a breastfeeding mom, uh, babies may want or need to eat at night longer than uh, your friends who are formula feeding their babies, and that's okay. Um, if you want to learn more about how to gradually begin to reduce a particular nighttime feeding, there's a link here that we, again, the sleep support webinar we did on Tuesday uh, focused on this topic, the gentle, gradual reduction of feeding. Um, as your baby begins to sleep longer, so as you begin to get that um, coveted and delightful seven, uh, you know, five, six, seven hour stretch, uh, sometimes moms are concerned because how is their body going to adjust? And it's a real shame when your baby is sleeping longer and it's your breasts that wake you up instead of the baby because uh, moms will often lay there in bed with their breasts over full and uncomfortable, uh, afraid to pump because they know that if they pump, the baby will probably wake up right away after they're done or um, because they've heard or read that uh, if they pump, they're going to continue that cycle of making milk at a time that the baby isn't requesting it and that they should be letting their bodies adjust uh, to the baby's sleep cycle. So um, all of those things are probably true. And how you manage uh, nighttime fullness depends on uh, how uncomfortable you are, how full you are, how abrupt or Uh, typically you find that a baby is, starts going to sleep earlier um, and so for example you may uh, nurse at 730 do the bedtime routine get your baby down to sleep finally by 8 
um, and then have dinner, uh, watch TV, crash in front of the computer, spend some time with your partner or a friend, um, and then maybe you're going to get ready for bed around 10 or you know, 10, 11, that would be a good time for you to pump. Because if your baby is now going to sleep, for example, from uh, you know until 2 or 3 or 4 or even all the way through the night, uh, then the last time you nursed was 7.30. So it may be too long for you to go comfortably to go from 7.30 to 4 a.m. Uh, and so you can extend the length of time that you'll be physically comfortable if you pump before you go to sleep. So say the baby nurses at 730, you pump at 10, um, and then you may be comfortable enough to go from 10 until 4 when the baby wakes up. So pumping before you go to sleep can help. Um, also leaving the pump at the bedside set up and ready so that if and when your baby wakes up in the middle of the night, you can nurse your baby on one breast and express the other. Very commonly, babies in the middle of the night usually, uh, I shouldn't say usually, but sometimes are quite happy just taking one breast and falling back asleep. So if you're feeling quite full, you can let the baby nurse on one side and express the other. Um, and again, you'll have extra milk if you're back at work. That's a nice way to, uh, to, to keep your prolactin levels high. It's good for your milk production, and you can stash away a few extra ounces perhaps that way. Uh, so single pump while the baby nurses or double pump after the baby nurses, um, leaving the pump set up at the bedside or in the other room all set and ready. Um, don't spend any time going into the kitchen, turning on the lights, transferring the milk, putting it in the fridge, washing stuff. Uh, just leave your cold pack there so that when you're finished pumping, you can put the milk next to the cold pack and go back to sleep as soon as you can. Uh, and if you can avoid turning the lights on yourself and only have a dim light, that will help it help you fall back to sleep easier and sooner. Um, because we all know that sometimes we get up with the baby and then get the baby Thing to think about is trying to limit caffeine yourself after 12 noon and not turning the lights on uh, in the middle of the night. And then your sleeping position as you're letting your breasts adjust or adapt to uh, milk supply shifts. If you're someone that's prone to block ducts, um, be careful in terms of your milk production because, uh, I'm sorry, your, your sleeping position, because if you're sleeping on your side rock solid for four hours while your breasts are slowly filling, um, some women that are prone to block ducts can have uh, discomfort from that. So if you used a sleeping, um, a pregnancy wedge pillow or one of those body pillows, you may be able to use that to find some comfortable sleeping positions that don't put pressure on your breasts. One option, particularly for parents that have very young babies, uh, I would say in the maybe, you know, four to, to eight week age uh, is to begin expressing milk once a day or twice a day in the morning after breastfeeding and then putting that ounce uh, ounces of milk in the refrigerator and having partner offer that milk at the beginning of the night uh, for one of the early nighttime feedings so that you can go to sleep early. So for example, um, maybe the baby's doing that cluster feeding business and nursing um, at five, six, seven, eight. Um, and then um, maybe you can go off in the other room or in the bedroom and crash. Eleven, twelve, when the baby wants to eat again, and then the baby will probably be back up again at two, three, or four, and you're back on duty. So, uh, so you may be able to go five or six hours uh, with one feeding in the middle that the partner gives, or family member, or friend, or helper gives um, while you're sleeping, uh, and then you're kind of back on duty at, at you know one, two, three, or four when the baby is back up ready to eat again. So that's what I call a trade-off feeding. You're pumping in the morning, using that milk for the middle of the night, first feeding, and then you're back on. Uh, it's also very helpful to learn how to nurse on your side so that um, this is great for naps too. If you're exhausted in the afternoon, you can lay down with your baby, nurse your baby off to sleep, um, and then you can you know, read a book or uh, use your iPad um, or just rest yourself. Um, Sideline nursing, uh, I have a couple of diagrams and then the next page I, I show how to nurse um, on both breasts without rolling over and having to bring the baby onto the other side. So uh, something that's beneficial is um, notice you want to have a firm flat surface, there's no pillows near the baby's face, um, and then using these roll, a rolled receiving blanket behind the baby's back is helpful so that as the baby uh, begins to fall asleep, 
he or she doesn't slightly roll back a little bit with the nipple in the mouth, and that creates a more shallow latch, which ultimately can cause a lot of discomfort if the baby is sucking just on the nipple tip. So here's how you can nurse on both breasts, and this is absolutely worth trying if your baby is very young. I know we have a couple people with, uh, with young infants here. Um, don't get discouraged. Um, I suggest practicing during the day when the lights are on and your shirt is off so that you've got your wits about you, you're awake, you can see what you're doing. Practice, practice, practice this so that uh, you get good at it and then it's easier to do um, you know, at night or early in the morning when you need to do it. Uh, again, a body pillow behind your back is helpful, a pillow between your knees and, and uh, a pillow under your head. And then uh, when you want to nurse on the bottom breast, you shift your hips and roll back so that you're, you're half on your back and half supported. Um, and uh, when you want to nurse on the top breast, you shift your hips and pivot forward a little bit um, and you use your top arm. immediately after completing it. So you can go back and look at these, uh, read them more carefully, click the links that I added, and so on. But this is definitely worth practicing. Um, another thing to remember when you're nursing in the sideline position is your babies should always be in good alignment. So they should never be laying on their back with their head turned towards you. Remember to keep their nose and their belly button in a straight line, and that will help you in terms of positioning. So their nose and belly button should be in a straight line. You notice how in the pictures the baby is on his side facing mom, not on his back with the head turned. It's very hard to swallow uh, with your head turned. Okay, in terms of bringing the baby um, into, your, into your bed to nurse or to sleep or uh, middle of the night to resettle a, a restless baby, um, these are scary. So uh, on a couch is really never safe because uh, the key things when it comes to sleep is suffocation and entrapment. That's what we need to avoid. Uh, suffocation means um, the baby's head uh, is, uh, is covered by something that's soft or puffy and they can't get free flow of oxygen or they rebreathe their own carbon dioxide. That's what suffocation means. And entrapment means the baby can get wedged between two pillows or a parent's body and a couch cushion, um, or um, uh, they can get in, uh, entrapped or entangled uh, in something as well. So uh, those are scary things. And I also will point out, in addition to this um, scary couch uh, pillow, uh, couch image, there's pets involved. And when we talk about co-sleeping or bed sharing, we're always talking about a, a breastfeeding mother and a baby. Um, and uh, the research does seem to show that a breastfeeding mom uh, is, is very in tune with her baby's sleep. And um, when you put two siblings together, a five-year-old and an infant, uh, or a golden retriever and an infant, uh, they are not, they're not cognizant, uh, they're not aware of the risk of the infant, and they're not, they're, they're, they don't have protective mechanisms in their brain uh, to, to alert to a baby that you know, is moving around, for example. Um, so remember, firm, flat surface, no pillars or quilts near the baby, uh, breastfeeding mom, no couches or easy chairs. Um, I never like to use the term safe this or safe that. I try to talk about safer um, because um, having the baby in your bed can be done in safer ways and less safe ways, just like having a baby in a crib can be done in safer ways and less safe ways. Uh, so again, keep points. A firm, flat surface, no pillows or quilts near the baby, no gaps or crevices to the, for the baby to fall uh, or get stuck between. So that would be, for an example, uh, a mattress and a headboard or the mattress and the wall or two mattresses uh, shoved together. That creates a crevice or a potential gap that the baby could become entrapped in. Also, like we were talking about couch cushions, getting entrapped between a parent's body and a couch cushion or between two couch cushions. Very dangerous. Uh, breastfeeding mom. Uh, no drugs or alcohol or medications or even severe exhaustion, anything that's going to make mom less aware of her surroundings uh, and less um, attuned to her baby's movements and noises. Many of
spring. It's really important uh, if the baby is between mom and partner in bed that the partner know the baby is there. So that, that means that you know if it's five o'clock in the morning and you're going to bring your baby into bed to feed and snuggle, and um, sometimes you end up falling asleep with the baby there, you have to kick your partner and tell your partner that the baby's there between the two of you, or put the baby on your side as you see here and not in the middle. Now. Um, if you're going to do it like um, partner, mom, baby, then you either have to have the mattress on the floor, which is what you see here, like a futon on the floor, a uh, mattress on the floor, so that if, God forbid, the baby rolls, the baby does not have a, a far drop. Um, or you can get a safe toddler bed rail. So sometimes we'll do partner, mom, baby, bed rail. Um, and no bed sharing with smokers. Sleeping in close proximity to a smoker uh, is, a, is a known high risk factor for, uh, for SIDS. And here's some links for more information. Um, James McKenna, whose name you'll hear again, is uh, probably the most uh, prominent researcher when it comes to mother baby breastfeeding and sleep. Um, and um, Erin Evans is um, our senior sleep consultant and uh, sleep team co-leader here at ISIS Parenting. She's also a, a sleep scientist at uh, Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. And she's written a, an article that's on our blog um, that's about informed bed sharing. Uh, again, this just reiterates what we were talking about. This is what the AAP recommends, um, that the baby sleeps on their back on a firm, flat surface, but it's a separate surface from mom. And um, they don't recommend bed sharing throughout the night, but they do uh, talk about bringing the baby into bed for feeding and resettling, and then moving the baby to a separate sleep surface. Um, and again, here's just two pictures to think about. Uh, here's uh, on the left what I consider an unsafe uh, crib environment. So there looks like there's a lot of padding, there's a lot of blankets and stuffed animals and so on. Um, a lot of you know potential risk for suffocation. Uh, and then okay, everybody has an opinion when it comes to nighttime parenting. Um, and uh, here's some links that you can look at. The AAP guidelines, American uh, Breastfeeding Medicine, they have a clinical policy on co-sleeping and breastfeeding. Um, and you can imagine, because you're talking, this, these are the breastfeeding physicians. Um, and of course, they're more uh, positive about uh, co-sleeping done with safety guidelines. James McKenna, uh, he definitely leans toward being pro-bed sharing. Um, but he does have some interesting studies. And then um, if you're struggling with sleep, um, a lot of times people will ask me for breastfeeding advice and uh, regarding uh, feeding at night. And once I start talking to them, you know, it's clearly uh, not so much about breastfeeding, but more about sleep associations. And that's a sleep issue. Um, and I, I, you know, I lead that team too. So um, the sleep support program is a very nurturing approach. Um, we do phone-based consults. We've done almost 3,000 of them. Um, I put the link here so you can read some of the parent reviews. And um, we do lots of slow through the nurturing approaches if that interests you. Um, if you're bed sharing, if you're nursing, if, you're, if your parenting style is nursing at night and you don't want to restrict your baby and so on, um, then, you know, then we work with the parameters that, that you're comfortable with. Um, Weekly webinars for sleep, just like these breastfeeding webinars, we do every every Tuesday at 12 noon. We have a sleep webinar, and the archives are posted. Um, and on this past Tuesday, we talked about how to gently reduce nighttime feeding. Uh, and then there's an hour-long webinar uh, that Erin Evans. Um, I can't. I don't know what the topic next week is going to be. I haven't figured that one out yet. I was still making the slides for today, uh, ten minutes before uh, the webinar. So uh, I will get there. Um, I see we ran a little late because I try to end at twelve thirty. I'm going to do very quick two questions. In addition to sleep questions, uh, I have one other. My son, seven months, has recently started sticking his finger into his mouth while nursing. Is this something I should be worried about or doing something about? Adorable. Um, no, and funny, uh, because as uh, he and you both will get, he'll figure out, and you already know, he cannot nurse with a finger in his mouth. He can't get a good latch. Um, I think that uh, you can tell him that. You can help him uh, draw his hand out of his mouth so that he can finish nursing. And if he wants to keep doing it, then he may want to chew. 
um, and not nursed. And um, babies are very oral. They love to suck and chew. And now that he's seven months old, he can get his hands and toys into his mouth. And so having a variety of teeters and, and sucking and chewing toys will be nice for him. Um, but he'll, he'll put everything in his mouth at any opportune time. And my favorite picture is the baby lying on his or her back with his foot stuffed in his mouth. So please email me or tweet me that picture uh, because I'm collecting them and I'm going to make a big Pinterest board of babies with their feet stuffed in their mouth. Um, but uh, nothing you should worry about, nothing that you really can uh, do about it except laugh and tell him that he cannot latch with a finger in his mouth. Uh, and which does he want to do? Um, and uh, he'll figure it out and, and move away. We've got another seven month old. This mom says, my, my son is seven months and finally sleeping through the night. Very nice. Uh, as a result, my milk supply has gone down dramatically. That's not so nice. Um, we don't use formula at all. I work full time. I pump three times a day at work and then nurse when I'm home. What should I do to increase my supply again? I tried Fetty Week and it gave me stomach issues. Okay. Um, so my suggestion would be to express milk uh, before you go to sleep. Um, and um, more often. So even though um, it's you know exhausting to try to figure out when you can squeeze those pumpings in, I think um, you know some of the things that we talked about in today's webinar will make sense to you, like seeing if you can pump before you go to sleep, uh, leaving your pump set up so that um, if at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning you wake up and your breasts are full, you can sit up drowsily and pump for five or seven minutes. Uh, and that will both peak your prolactin levels so that overall you make more milk. And that uh, will also hopefully give you several more ounces a day for storage so that um, you know, your supply keeps up and your, and your milk production keeps up with his needs. Um, another benefit of nighttime nursing, uh, I'll just you know, stick out a couple of good ones for you there, is that um, if you can, the longer you can go, uh, without having uh, a six to eight hour period of time uh, without nursing or pumping, the more likely it is that you may be able to uh, push off ovulation and your menstrual cycle returning. So uh, there's no science to it uh, in terms of promises um, because some women unfortunately do get their periods back even six and eight weeks after delivery even though they're breastfeeding full time around the clock. Uh, but in general, most women will find that their periods come back shortly after their baby begins to sleep in much longer stretches at night. So once you start going uh, eight hours without nursing or pumping, usually that's enough to let your prolactin levels dip a little bit and then your menstrual cycle returns. So if you haven't gotten your period back and you like that, um, then that might make you feel better about getting up once, uh, you know, at, at two or three or four o'clock in the morning to nurse uh, or even to pump. But if your baby is sleeping, you know, through, um, I always feel bad suggesting that a working mom get up and pump in the early morning because you need your sleep. So that's why I you know, try to encourage you to pump at bedtime before you go to sleep. Uh, and then depending on what your morning routine is like, you may be able to nurse your baby in the morning and then pump. Always, uh, we really try to get, uh, we like to have 20 people in the room uh, for every webinar, so uh, we were close today. Um, and um, if you have suggestions for topics for next week, um, I'm open to that. If not next week, I'll, I'll get to them. Um, I usually have no uh, issue coming up with a good topic, but um, you know. Uh, also, please make sure you check the archives because. Um, at this point now, we've got, I think, 35 uh, recorded webinars on so many different topics. Um, and um, so whether it's starting solid foods or dealing with blocked ducts or increasing supply or uh, overactive letdown and oversupply, um, of course, my favorite poop talk, uh, you name it, it's probably there. And if it's not there, then damn it, I should do it. And then you should tell me what's missing, and I will do it. Okay, everybody, have a fabulous, wonderful week. I hope you have uh, good nighttime nursing and um, some periods of uninterrupted sleep as well. And uh, I will see you uh, next week in the breastfeeding webinar and maybe on Tuesday at the sleep webinar. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, Katie.